Hey everyone, today's video is a continuation of our SIGU series, this one focused on central lines. And we're going to specifically focus on the different types of central lines, not so much the different areas you can place a central line, but the actual physical characteristics of the pieces of these plastic catheters that make up central lines, and how those different characteristics lead to different qualities, which of course uh, can help you select the correct line for the correct patient in the correct situ clinical situation. So first, just to get back to the absolute basics, what is a central line? Um, and another name for these is a central venous catheter, or CVC. Uh, and that name, I think, is a little bit more explanatory. So it's a catheter in a vein that drains centrally. Um, so you can think of these as central alternatives to peripheral IVs, or PIVs, which, of course, is how we give all of our intravenous medications to our patients at baseline. Um, of course, catheter is a bit self-explanatory, uh, vein is self-explanatory as well, but the central, this really means, at least for the lines that go in the upper body, typically the capoatrial junction, or where the SVC uh, drains into the right atrium, um, or for the uh, lines coming from the leg, for example, femoral lines, those usually just drain into the IVC, but either way, that's a fairly central place, a uh, place in a large uh, diameter vein that's relatively close to the heart. So why do we need central venous catheters? Why can't we just use peripheral IVs for everything? Well, one benefit that people might talk about a bit is resuscitation. I put a bit of an asterisk about this because when we're talking resuscitation, we're talking about getting a lot of fluid into a patient in a short amount of time, uh, usually to help with blood pressure and things like that. Now, while a lot of people think that central lines are better than peripheral lines uh, when it comes to giving a lot of volume, this is actually not always true. And to highlight that, um, I want to point out here, for example, an eight and a half French sheath introducer, uh, which is about the size of some of the large resuscitative central lines that we would use, can infuse a liter in just over a minute. But a 14 gauge IV only takes a minute and a half. And so actually, when we're thinking about trauma resuscitations or situations where we really have to quickly resuscitate a patient, the uh, standard of care, what we recommend is and this is per ATLS protocols, is we want two large bore IVs. You imagine if there are two 14 gauge IVs, this time gets cut in half down to 45 seconds. It's actually better for rapid transfusion resuscitation uh, than a large central line. So remember, if you're thinking resuscitation, always think um, two large bore IVs first. Remember, those are typically either 14 or 16 gauge IVs. And those work well because while they're a little bit thinner, they're much shorter. Um, and that uh, shortness of the tube decreases the resistance as well. Anyway, back to other uses for uh, central access or uh, central venous catheters. Another one is uh, giving toxic medications. Uh, these are typically medications that if they were given to these small blood vessels could damage the endothelium of those blood vessels because they're in a very high concentration in that small space. Whereas we, when you give them centrally, they can disperse a bit more, they're a bit less toxic. So some examples here are pressors like norepinephrine, epinephrine, etc. You can read more about these in our uh, pressors video. Uh, things like TPN. TPN especially, I believe the lipid component is much better administered centrally as opposed to peripherally. Uh, chemotherapy, um, and then solutions with really significant electrolyte concentrations. For example, hypertonic saline, like 3%, um, or some concentrated uh, electrolyte replacement solutions. So certain medications just require central access. You can't give them peripherally. Uh, another potential benefit is monitoring. This used to be more common, for example, when most patients in the ICU had Swan-Gans catheters, et cetera. So the Swan passes through a type of central line called introducer. We'll get to all that later. Um, this is becoming less and less common, so we're not going to cover it too much here. Uh, lack of peripheral access is another option. Maybe the patient has IVs that keep blowing. They have a lot of peripheral edema. It's just very hard for the team to get peripheral access. And the central venous catheter uh, can get around that. It can be easier to place in those situations. And it's a very durable uh, form of IV access. You don't have to worry at, about it blowing on you or not being able to work after just a few days, for example. Um, other situations where you'd want good durability would be, for example, outpatient therapy, where you're getting outpatient IV medications such as antibiotics or TPN. In those situations, you usually don't send patients home with uh, peripheral IVs. You don't want them to get stuck every time they get those medication infusions. So in those situations, uh, a central line can be useful.
And so if it has all these uses, why don't we just place central lines in every one? Why do we even have PIVs? And of course, there are, anytime we're talking about accessing um, large Venus structures, there's a potential for complications. And so in particular, a big complication we think about with central lines is CLABSIs or central line associated bloodstream infections and the uh, associated infection risk with central lines. As you can imagine, uh, anytime we think about foreign bodies in the human body, there's always a risk of infection and a central line is nothing if not a large foreign body that goes from your dirty, contaminated skin uh, and provides a kind of microbial superhighway right into your central bloodstream. And so the less time we have these catheters in, the less risk of those potentially very severe infections. Then the rest of the complications primarily relate to either the placement or removal of these central lines. <clears throat> And so when we're talking about, again, the upper body central lines like subclavians or IJs, uh, the lungs very nearby while you're placing them. So there's a risk of creating pneumothorax. You can, of course, get hemorrhage from any time you're dealing with large vascular structures. This is more common if you have an issue where you puncture the artery when you intend to puncture the vein. Uh, there's a risk of an air embolus while you're threading wires and doing things to upsize that catheter uh, in the blood vessel itself. Uh, and of course, there's a risk of arrhythmia or even cardiac arrest. Um, usually it's a benign arrhythmia just from wire manipulation of the right atria, et cetera. But again, no procedure is without risks. All right. And so now talking a bit about types of central lines. Really, this is a bit of an alphabet soup and it probably varies a bit by your institution. So I'll try to cover uh, kind of the multiple names for things, some of which might be normal at your institution and some of which might not be, uh, but we'll hopefully get this all on the same page. So at least at our institution, your main options are a triple lumen or triple lumen catheter. Uh, this is usually abbreviated TLC. Again, your institution might have a slightly different name that it goes by, but this is basically a relatively thin catheter with uh, three lumens. Uh, there's the introducer. This probably has, or the introducer sheath, this probably has the most names. Uh, some other brand names that are used for an introducer is something like a Cordis or a Mac, a multiple access catheter. Uh, these are slightly different catheters, more often used for resuscitation. We'll talk about those more later as well. Then there's lines that are used for dialysis in particular. Usually these could be just called a dialysis line. They could be called a dual lumen dialysis catheter. Uh, one common name used in our institution is a trialysis line which we'll talk about again in more depth, all of these later. And finally, kind of the, uh, the uh, odd member of the group is the PICC line or the peripherally inserted central catheter. So as the name implies, this is a still a central catheter, <clears throat> excuse me, that's actually inserted in the periphery as opposed to in one of those major central veins. And so it has some advantages in terms of a little bit probably safer to place, uh, probably a little bit less infection risk, but some disadvantages as well. All right, so a brief discussion about the locations for central lines. This isn't going to be a focus of this talk, but we should at least spend some time talking about it. Any of these lines can be placed in basically three locations. Um, the big picture is you need to have a relatively large vein because these catheters are relatively large caliber. Um, and you want it to be easily accessible with a needle. And so those veins are, by definition, usually the veins that are draining some sort of extremity or appendage, whether that's your arm, your leg, or your head, are really your three options. So when we think about draining the head, you have your IJs or internal jugular vein. Uh, the veins that drain the arms are the subclavian veins. And of course, the leg is drained by the femoral vein. Now I've listed these in this order uh, for a reason. So the most popular is definitely the IJ, the internal jugular vein. In particular, the right rather than the left, just because that slides smoothly down to that caboatrial junction. Um, some clavian veins are actually, or some clavian lines, I should say, are actually fallen quite a bit out of favor. Um, there's a couple issues with them. Um, relative to the IJ, for example, they're in a less compressible location. This needle stick is happening below the uh, clavicle. So if you have some sort of complication there, it's more difficult to hold pressure. You also can't use an ultrasound. You can use an ultrasound for the two other types of central line placements, which help make it uh, safer and easier and faster, less likely to have a complication. So clavian, again, that bone blocks the ultrasound waves and you just can't use it. Um, and so that's, it's kind of really come into play mostly in trauma patients uh, where the neck is obscured by a C collar. 
and subclavian really becomes your best option. Femoral, femoral lines, uh, they're a nice option as well. You can use an ultrasound to place them. Um, you can do it while people are working up by the neck or the head, for example, during a code situation. The problem is that the groin is kind of gross. There's moisture, there's hair, and there's an increased risk of infection down there in femoral lines. So while they are often used, um, definitely if I was to pick one, that's the preference, preference I would say the internal jugular vein. All right, so now to talk about each catheter uh, by themselves. And before I mention each catheter, I'm gonna say that regardless of the institution you're at, you probably have these three options, even if they're slightly different catheters or with slightly different names. And so this first option is the catheter you use when you really want central access, uh, primarily for some type of medication delivery, uh, but you're not massively resuscitating a patient right, right now, which is to say it's a relatively long catheter. It'll give you that central access. But each of the lumens are relatively small. You can see here, 16 gauge, 18 gauge, et cetera. So you can't slam a bunch of fluid through here because you have these small lumens and they have to travel this long way through this long uh, sheath itself. So like I've said up here, it has many relatively small lumens, good for medications that need central delivery, but you can't rapidly push fluids through this. And so it's a bit limited in the high volume resuscitation. Again, triple lumen catheter, TLC. Uh, its size is roughly seven French, typically. All right, your next option, this is the introducer sheath that we talked about. Some might call it a cordis or a MAC. Um, at least our institution, our version of this is roughly nine French. You can see it's also a bit shorter than the other catheter. So it's wide and short. So that's, of course, good for giving high volumes of fluid over short amounts of times. It's also an introducer, so it can be used to introduce other things through this channel right here. For example, swans, uh, transvenous pacers, etc. But what it has in size, it lacks in number of lumens. So if you want to give a bunch of different medications, maybe you have a patient that you have trouble getting IV access, so you want to give them both their central medications and other medications through this line, uh, you don't have a ton of options. You really just have this one lumen, unless you modify it by placing something through uh, this introducer sheath. For example, you can, I think this might be the dilator as opposed to a slick, but there's something called a slick, which you can place through the introducer itself. And then you would have two lumens, one here and one here. All right, and your final options or your third option, in addition to having one line that's good for central access, but not resuscitation, another one that's good for resuscitation, but less good for multiple central access, Excuse me. Our third option is our lines for dialysis. And so these could be dual lumen or triple lumen lines. At our institution, it's typically a trialysis line. And one thing I want you to know is that these are big lines, so 13 French. If you recall, our triple lumen was 7 French. Uh, our introducer was 9 French. And this is almost double the size of both of those lines. Of course, you do need very high flow rates for dialysis. So this is great. You have your two 12 gauge lumens for rapid fluid exchange for dialysis. Then the trialysis line has a third lumen, the smaller 17 gauge lumen for the delivery of other, other medications centrally, which is of course, usually going to be quite useful for patients in the ICU. All right, and finally, you have the PIC or the peripherally inserted central catheter. This is similar to our other lines. It enters through a vein and tries to sit here centrally at that cavoatrial junction. But it's usually placed through a vein in the upper arm. So for example, the brachial, basilic, or cephalic veins. And it tracks from that space all the way into the heart. And so what's good about this is it's probably less infection risk. It goes through a smaller vein. It's not in the groin. Um, it's a little bit easier to keep well-dressed. Um, there's fewer placement complications. Uh, even if you have an issue, you're dealing with relatively small blood vessels. Um, and it's good for things like outpatient therapy, for example. A patient can go home with a PICC line where you not, might not be as comfortable with them having a large central line in place. Uh, it's good for prolonged use. It's not going to blow like some of your other peripheral lines. And of course, it's very bad for things like high volume resuscitation because you have these tiny lumens that travel uh, this very long distance to get into the heart. So if you're trying to resuscitate a patient, uh, not a great choice. 
Um, some other considerations is thinking about the number of lumens, at least at our institution. These are placed by specialized teams. You have to ask them, do you want one lumen, two lumen, three lumens? Um, and the trade-off here is, of course, with multiple lumens, you can give more medications. Uh, but at least what they teach us at our institution is that the more lumens, the higher the infection risk. And so you really want to only choose the number of lumens that you need. So if it's only for one thing, like for example, TPN, maybe you only need one lumen. But if you're going to give TPN and other medications, you need at least two, for example. All right, so let's run through a few clinical scenarios and uh, pick which line we think is appropriate. So in this patient, we've got someone in the ICU, they're requiring pressors, which of course require that central access. Um, they're requiring numerous other medications, but they are well resuscitated. We're not worried that we have to throw a bunch of fluid or a bunch of blood in them really fast, for example. So in this situation, probably the best choice is that first option, the triple lumen catheter, triple lumen, the one that is a relatively small line uh, that gives us at least three lumens to infuse all these different medications and because we think they're well resuscitated, the fact that we can't push through its fluids through this very quickly is not a disadvantage. Another option could be something like a pick line. Uh, but of course, that usually requires another team to come, take some more time, etc. So if you have time, you could consider a pick as well. All right, a crashing patient in the trauma bay. Of course, this patient is in hypovolemic or hemorrhagic shock by definition until proven otherwise. And so which center line would you choose in this situation? And that's actually a trick question because what you should be choosing is two large bore peripheral IVs. Remember, these actually transfuse at least as fast, usually faster than any sort of central line you can put in. They're able to be placed much faster, uh, they're safer. And so something like two 14 to 16 gauge IVs at the antecubital fossas or more proximally is actually what you want in this patient. Now, if you cannot get those peripheral IVs in place, then you can consider placing a central line. Of course, you could also be considering placing IOs, et cetera, although those don't, um, are amazing for pushing through a ton of volume. And so if you had to place a central line in this patient because you can't get that good peripheral access, then you would want to place an introducer, also known as a cortis, because you want that short fat line that you're able to push through the uh, maximum volume of resuscitation. All right, uh, next scenario is a patient that they're all ready to discharge home, but unfortunately they can't eat for whatever reason and they're gonna discharge on home TPN, which is of course another medication that requires central access. And whenever we're talking about outpatient therapy, usually you're thinking about PICC lines. So those peripherally inserted lines, lower risk of infection, easier for patients to manage at home, et cetera. Another option that wouldn't really be placed by us would be something like a tunneled central line. Uh, usually that's placed by interventional radiology at most institutions. All right, and final scenario. So you've got an ICU patient. They're on pressors. So they need central access to get that medication, uh, but they also need CVVH or CVVHD. So they need some sort of dialysis. They're also on pressors. So you, you'd like that option to have central access as well. And so this is a great example of a situation where a trialysis line would be really useful because you can give dialysis through that line and you can also administer central medications. All right, so that's it. Um, to review, uh, your institution will probably have these same three primary options, even if they might be slightly different catheters. Uh, your option for one, multiple lumen central access, but not great for resuscitation, like a triple lumen catheter. Your option for a big resuscitative central line, like an introducer, and an option for a dialysis line, like a trialysis catheter, or long-term central access, where you don't want infections, you know this line will be in for a while, and you don't need to resuscitate through it like a pick. That's it. These videos are for educational purposes only, not use them to diagnose or treat any diseases, and we will see you next time.